Thanks, Martin. So now I'm actually very nervous <laughs> because coming after Mabel, right? <laughs> Pardon my coding. Uh. <laughs> okay, so it may not be the best code and cleanest one. There's no typescripting. Okay, so pardon me. Okay, so as Martin introduced me, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, but master of none. Okay, so my main objective here is just to get it to work. Okay, so I feel like a student getting marked by, you know, maybe. <laughs> okay, so the topic that I'm going to touch on today, right, is the automatic cube creation. But actually, the, the whole idea is to have a small program that will allow the end users to interactively create a Python BI analytic tool platform, okay, so that they can create dashboard, perform some analytics. Well, skip the technical part first. Let me show you what I'm trying to say. So I have this particular notebook that I've already run through, ignore all the coding. So here I have a button. What I'm going to do is click on it, select a data set. So here I have pre-downloaded some data sets from Cargo. So I'm going to choose the avocado.csv, okay? And here, once I select that, right, I have, the, I have a list of columns that is from the data set, okay? So the next step now is to choose a set of keys. So what are keys here? So in Atoti, Keys are meant for us to identify unique data rows in your data set. Why is that important? Okay, so first of all, when, the, when your data set is not unique, when there are duplicates, based on these sets of keys, right, the last uploaded record will actually overwrite the first, the previously uploaded data. Okay, so we will only keep the latest uh, unique data set, okay, in the cube. So the other, the second reason why we have the keys is that because Atoti actually dictionarize based on these keys so that it will speed up your querying, okay? So the, the query performance will be much faster in that sense. Okay, so in case, you know, you don't know anything about the data, you can always choose none. What does this mean? It means that all the columns are used to identify the unique rows, okay? So if nothing, choose none. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to choose date and then type year and region. And once I submit that, you can see that my program starts creating a session and then it will actually take the data that I have uploaded, right, and create some tables, Atoti table. I'll give it a little while, you know. Then here you can see that I actually have a progress bar that is moving as my, my program creates. So then once data is created into the cube, voila. So now I have a BI analytic platform from one CSV, okay? So can you imagine your user is, you know, like not very savvy, you know, but they, they, they have a data set that they want to analyze, right? So if you create this small little program, you give it to them and say, hey, now you can actually analyze. Huh. But they stare at this. What do I do next? Right, I have a, a GUI here. So next, we go and create a new dashboard here. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. It's very big. <laughs> Let me just reset it a little bit. Okay, so here, right, on the left-hand side, we have a couple of drawers. So we have the content editor. I'll come back to this later on. And then we have some filter editor, widgets, as well as style editor. And on the top here, we have the ribbons. So I think it's pretty intuitive because it's similar to how your Excel works now, right? You have the ribbons. So then you have some editor on the left. So what I'm going to do now, I am going to say, I'm going to create the years. I, let me select the years. And then I'm going to say, I want to know what is the total volume of avocados I've sold across the year. So now I have a table. And if you're not happy with a table, okay, I'm not happy with the table, I want to see a trend. Let me switch over to a line chart. Easy peasy, right? Okay, so now let's say your user say, hmm, this is not very interesting. I can split it again by the type. So now I have the trend of the conventional uh, avocado versus the organic avocado, okay? And of course you can drag and drop even more of them. Let's say for example, I want to compare the across the years, okay? I say I want to compare uh, maybe the sales of 2017 against 2018, okay? And then I say, let's look at the total volume so now here you can see that we have the difference across the two years. So 
the, the dashboard is yours to build. I mean, you can play around with the different kind of visualizations. You know, you can have a pivot table uh, that allows you to drill down. Let's say, for example, I can say for each region, I want to look at the sales, the dates for the dates. So maybe I want to see the large bags, small bags, and the total bags, right? And then let me just collapse this a little bit. And we can add a bit of storytelling, some some interactive component for your end users. So let's say, for instance, now I select region. I can multiple select, you know, like I want to add in, let's say, California, Chicago. Okay. If you don't want to show them as a multi-select, you can always change it to single select, for instance, that at any point in time, they will only be able to select one. So the question now to you is, how much time would you take to develop this as an application yourself? <laughs> You know, it's for one data source, for one CSE file, is it worth the effort to build a whole BI analytic platform? Not really, right? So that's the cool thing about Python because there are so many libraries out there, right? So you just need to have an idea, look for the correct library, piece them up like Legos, and then you get something like this, you know? So now I can easily go back to my notebook. I click on upload again. So another data set that I've downloaded from Cargo, DS Salary, okay? So now I reset the whole program again. And then I say, okay, based on the work year, or maybe I will just choose none this time around. Okay, I don't select any key. And you see here, I'm deleting the existing unnamed session to create the new one. What this means is actually because I'm a bit lazy, you know, like I don't perfect it, but rather, <laughs> You know, I just want to explore the data, right? I want to allow my user to explore the data anytime they are ready. So I will destroy the previous session, re-instantiate and create a new one. So now the users can actually go in and then look at what is the salary for this job title, for instance. Okay. And then maybe now you see the problem here now is my work year becomes a sum. I have a mean and a sum. I don't know if it's big enough for you to see. Okay. So I have mean and sum for every columns, right? So in R2T, when you have a data set, okay, there's two types of columns we have. Okay, numerical and non-numerical. Normally when we want to look at a business metrics, we look at the figures, but along some hierarchies, right? What hierarchies, like for example, company location, right? So in this case, year should be a hierarchy, but it becomes a metric now. That's because I didn't select it as a key. So theoretically, I should have selected it as a key, then it will be created as a column, then I will be able to query it. Okay, now, so far, okay? Am I boring you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as you can see, we can easily build everything together. So now let's take a quick look. Here, you can see that I've created and saved a dashboard. I could actually save it. So just now I didn't perform a save. So it actually becomes, you know, like blank here. But let me just go back to the technology behind this. Let me just zoom a little bit out. Okay, so in this particular notebook, I use a couple of libraries. But most importantly, I want to highlight two libraries, okay? I guess, you know, for the interactive component, can you all guess what library I use? <laughs> no, no, I use IPy widget. Okay, so IPy widget allows you to have this kind of you know float bar, progress bar, you know the multi select as well as the buttons, upload buttons, so and so forth. So check it out, you know IPy the Jupyter widgets, IPy widgets. You know there are a list of interactive uh, components that you can actually put into the Jupyter notebook. Okay, to have this kind of interactions here. Okay, so that's the first part to having this program here to allow your users select their own CSV and then create a BI analytic platform. So second part, easy, right? Exactly, <laughs> that's why I'm here today. Okay, so Atoti is actually a free uh, Python library, so you can download it and play along with it. Okay, around with it. So. Now, let's take a look. I won't go into the details of how we integrate, you know, the IPy widget. So, so long as you know how to retrieve the data source, pass it on to the next function, I mean, then you can piece up this whole program, right? And anyway, it's available later on. I'll be sharing it with you. 
Now, let's look at the Create Cube. Let me zoom a little bit. Okay, so it's very straightforward. Step one, we create a session. Okay, a Toti session. So in this session, right, what I've done here is I've fixed a port to 9090. You can change the port. By default, you can don't even pass anything to the variable. Okay, when you don't pass anything to the session, it will create a random port number for you, which is bad. Okay, if you're just playing around, trying to explore some data, it's fine. But if you're going to share your dashboard with someone else, okay, say for example, the dashboard that we created earlier on, uh, see now it's broken because I recreate, you know, the, the, the notebook. So the data has changed, the column has changed. But suppose if I want to share the dashboard, right, that I have here, I can just send this URL to someone else, provided they're on the same network. This is local host, so nobody can access my machine, okay? So then I will want to fix the port so that, you know, they don't have to rebookmark the dashboard every time, right? Secondly, firewall. If you're going production with an actual project, right, with this, then you need to fix it for the firewall, okay? It's more controllable when you fix the port. Then step two, of course, just now earlier on, we have selected the CSV, upload into the notebook, right? So in this use case, I have converted into a Panda data frame, okay? And of course, the keys here is the key that you have selected earlier on to identify your unique, unique data set, right? So now, using session.readPandas, I could actually create an, an RTT table and load the data into the table. So, but of course, in a proper project setting, we would first of all create a table, then we load the data in. Okay, but for this case, because I want it to be dynamic, so it should create based on whatever the user uploaded, right? So using read pandas, it will automatically create a table structure based on the available column in the data set. Okay? So the next step is to take this table and create a cube. So anyone play with a cube before? OLAP cube? No? Okay, so basically Atoti creates an in-memory data cube that would allow you to, you know, view the data in, in different dimensions. You can actually slice and dice, you know, just switch your perspective around. Like how I drilled down just now, you know, I can look at the year, I can look at the company, I can switch my view anytime I want. Okay, so that's the beauty of having a cube. But of course, later on I'll tell you more about our cube. It's different from the typical OLAP that you have. Okay? And then finally, here I'm just calling the, I'm just using web browser to open a URL. So using session.link, okay, so this is actually, uh, you know, it should be a private function, but here to facilitate, so I'm using the local URL. But with session link, actually I'll be able to get the, the URL to the web application, so then it will launch it, okay, then you can start building it. So this is very easy. For Four main statement to create the cube, and then voila, you have your BI analytic platform. Okay, let's go. <laughs> okay, so now we are done with the basic crash course. Of course, if it's so basic, then my company wouldn't want me anymore, right? So I will say adios, <laughs> goodbye. Okay, so now I've created an advanced version just for this, this session, okay? So what can I advance on? Okay, before I, I do this advance, advance mode, right? Let's look at, let's have a quick recap on what we can actually do here. Okay, so basically the idea is that we create a session, okay? So, and then using the session, right? In the session, we can actually do data loading. So we create an RTT table, we load the data, or the other way around, we could use the connector to directly read your data source and create the table. So there's two ways that we can go about it. And we have a few data type, I mean the data connectors such as SQL, Sparks, Pandas, Parquet, CSV, NumPy, for instance. So another beauty of Python, you know, if I don't have the connector, I'm sure you can load it into Pandas, right? <laughs> or you can load it into NumPy, you know, like Sparks, data frame, so, so long as you can load into a certain format that my connector can connect, right, can, can load, right, then you can use Atoti. And I show you the simplest 
basic format, which is one single table. But if you imagine like a database, you can have multiple tables depending on how your data source is being organized, right? So you can actually join this table together based on the columns, you know, similar columns, you join them together. Then you have a snowflake schema, okay? So by snowflake schema, what we meant is that we will have a base store that contains the most granular level data. Okay, so we will use that base table to create a cube. And what I've shown you just now is just a single cube within a session. Within a session, you can have multiple cubes if you want. So again, that is a little bit of how you plan your data model, right? So you will group like data of the same structure together, you know, the same storyline. You know, if your company wants to see the PNL versus, you know, like intraday liquidity or whatever, you know, in finance world, then you can have different cube and then they are all accessible within one BI platform. Okay, so it's one, one session, one BI application. So far, okay? Okay, then let me quickly show you again what is the difference. So same thing here, I scroll right to the bottom, I do the upload. So now I will use a financial data set, the VAR, the VAR data set, which is the value at risk. So first of all, you can see that now I explore using a different IPI widget. So I use checkboxes for my keys. Okay, you can see that all the columns are being exposed here. And I have a drop down list here. Can anyone guess what is this drop down list for? The types. Hmm? The types. Exactly. Oh, you listen to Mabel, right? <laughs> okay, so let's take a quick look at my data. Okay, so my data set, because it's a financial use case, and in finance, right, we want to know the daily profit and loss. So can you imagine I have a figure per day across 300 over days, right? And then if I were to store it as an actual data row, then I have to identify the key. Let's say I have instrument code, book ID, then the day, the day, and then I have the value. So then this is multiplied by 365. So your data set is huge. But by having a list to store each day, the value for each day, right, I compress my original data set, right? But if I were to load this data set into Pandas, right, what do you think will be the data type inferred? <coughs> a string, unless you cast it, right? Yeah. So it will be treated as a string, which no, I wouldn't want a, a list to be treated as string, right? So that is why over here, I could choose my PNL vector as a Boolean array. Okay, and then let me select my keys to the data set. And then again, I submit it. Okay, so there's some other slight differences, but let me just show you once this is created. So you can see that here I have flagged out all the numeric numerical columns because later on we will see that I actually created some additional measures in this system. Instead of just now we saw we have default just a mean and a sum, right? When Arthur T creates it. So can anyone spot the difference? Nobody? Huh? No, this is the default landing page. So the main difference is that now I have a demo folder and I have data exploration, right? Let me go into the presentation mode. Just now earlier on, when I restart the session, it was a clean page. Nothing is persist, even though I created some dashboard, you know, I did some things, right? So by default, Atoti will not persist anything. So the data cube is created in memory, your tables are in memory, the dashboard, the widgets, the filters, whatever you created is in memory. So when you re-instantiate a session, everything is gone, right? But we can actually persist it if we want. So that is the first change in this advanced notebook that I have done. So let's quickly go back to the code again, okay? So you can see that in my, sessions, uh, in my session function, other than the port number, here, I have also created something called, I have used the parameter user content storage, okay? So in this content folder here that I've defined, let me go back to my root folder. You can see it here. And I actually have this content mv.db. So this is actually a H2 database, okay? So this will actually store the widgets that you create or, you know, the filters that you have saved, as well as the dashboards you have saved. So now, 
if I want to share with someone else, I could actually copy this. I do a incognito window, say for example, paste this, and then you should be able to view the exact same dashboard. So if you put this on the cloud, you know, then you have a public UR, uh, IP address, then you can actually share it with any of your collaborator. And the good thing is because everything is created on the fly, right? So whatever changes that I do in the Jupyter Notebook, you know, the other side will be able to see the changes immediately. Okay, so far, the first change. Okay, so now that we have persisted, the next thing that I want to show you is that as a user, you know, who doesn't really code, and then, you know, like, ah, I want to do something, right? Do I have to go back to IT, you know, like I just want to compute something new. If I have to go back to IT, then you go through the uh, requirement gathering, you go through the, the development and then the UAT, SIT UAT production, then, oh, I got my final project <laughs> one month, three months later, right? So now there is this function called new calculated measure, okay? For example, I'm going to do a PNL, okay? So square bracket for, this is basically the syntax for OLAPS, okay? So I can do a M, and then you can see that it's auto-suggesting what are the available values. So then now here, I'm going to take my PNL dot value, okay? And then I'm going to multiply it by another measure. Say in this case, I want it to be quantity dot sum, okay? So I can add it to view, and then, ah, I've added it to the wrong view because this is actually my selected widget. So you can see that I have my PNL here. Let me just do a small change. I'm going to save. Uh, okay, let me go back a little bit. Sorry, it's a little bit small. Let me undo it. Undo it. Ah, okay. So now I have my PNL here. Okay. So I'm going to do a save. Okay, I save my calculated measure. So this is where it gets committed into the H2 database that I told you earlier on. And then I could actually select the correct widget now, and then I can go to my file and then my save measure. I select this and then I apply it. So let me go back to the presentation mode. So now I have the quantity multiplied by my PNL value to get this PNL here. Okay, so your users do have some control over some measurements that they want to do on the fly without going back to IT. Okay, now, any questions so far? Okay, nobody's mm -hmm. asleep yet, right? <laughs> okay, one question. Oh, yeah, one question. Um, are those safe sessions all shared by one login, or like can different users have different sets of saved sessions in the H2 and? Well, so basically you view this as an application. So many users assess the application. So there's only one session. Okay. Yeah, of course you can create multiple sessions within the Jupyter Notebook, but each one will have their own web application. So if the new guy comes and like deletes something, is there a way to roll back to like... Wow, <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> that is a process outside paper. <laughs> Maybe we can advise on that, right? Because then that's where your GitHub control, you know, or Bitbucket comes in, you know, you have your commit and etc. And theoretically, you shouldn't be sharing the same notebook because there is one kernel only for each notebook, right? So if you restart the kernel, then the session is gone. So theoretically, you should be having something like maybe Jupyter Hub, where everybody can spin up their own instance, they copy a version of this notebook, adapt it to their own use. But as a project, right, if you're running it as a project, typically, Mabel is here. <laughs> Typically, you wouldn't run Jupyter Notebook in production. You, you, would you can run in Docker, right? Not like uh, yeah. Usually, if you want to maintain it for a long period of time, then they can choose not to run in the Jupyter Notebook, right? I mean, yeah. Up to them. Yeah. So theoretically, you could extract this out and then put into a Python script, right? But then you will lose the IPy widgets mm. interactive component. Yeah. Last, last thing, sorry, this is for QA. Um, does that totally provide hosting of these Jupyter notebooks? Or um, just the host no, no, no. Host so it's just a Python library. Okay. Yeah. So you can use it in Python project or in in the notebook. Okay. okay. Yeah. So of course, you know, like it's 
basically right fundamentally Atoti is a BI analytic platforms you know it provides you the holistic solution so you should be able to create your own measurements you know your own measures KPIs based on your formulas computation so here right in this program I only incorporated a very simple measure which is called a single value so then of course this is where I bring you back to my product <laughs> okay going back to the documentation right if we go to the reference Okay, of course you can install, you know, and then go through the tutorial how to use it for for your own project or you know for this particular ones. And okay, uh, so under the API references, let's say for example, I just look at the aggregation module. Okay, so then you see I have long max, max member, mean, medium, etc. A lot of functions available here, and then not to mention that I have like if you want to order your data by some scope, uh, you want to perform some functions like date difference or shift the date or look at the parent value, so on and so forth. So if you have a formula, then it's a matter of how you use the various functions to put together to create your formulas, right? To chain them up. So it's pretty much like in Excel, you know, you, you have your Excel function and then you formulate them bit by bit and then chain them up together. Right, but however, it's in Jupyter Notebook. So in this use case, right, what I am using is the single value. Maybe it's not very intuitive. So basically, the idea is that for a member, for the members of the level, if you have the same value for all the members, it will return you that number. But if it's different, then it will not return you anything. Say, for example, if you go to a, a, a shop, and then for all the Hitachi, they sell Hitachi TV, let's say they sell $500, okay? But then there's one particular model that sells $499. Uh, so it won't be able to return you the value for Hitachi TV. But let's say for maybe Samsung, it returns $999 for all the TVs, then single value will return you $999, okay? So it's very minute, but then you'll find that in some cases we need that. Okay, so just to demonstrate that we can create some measures. So you can see that here, right, depending on how you want to, how, how dynamic you want your cube to be in this setup, you could actually add it on. You, could, you can actually expand it. Okay, and to go back a little bit to the, the, the part on the data type. So because Atoti will inf inherit the data type from the Panda data frame, okay, so we are actually taking the value that you have selected earlier on and cast it. So if you didn't select anything, right, for the data type, we will automatically take the value that is inferred by pandas. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So I think that is about it for the auto part. So if you guys are still with me, I can explain to you the technology about, I mean, behind my product. <laughs> okay. So, well, so it can be a Python project. Okay, so you just take the library, you take your own data, you take multiple data, create multiple table, you join them together, create a cube, you know, then you perform your computation, etc. Or you can make use of Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, like what I'm doing now. So Atoti has some custom features that helps us to leverage on Jupyter's function, right, to perform, well, to, 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 to explore your data. Okay, we'll see later on to make prototyping much faster and for interactive experience, okay? And underlying is actually Java. So actually I'm a Java developer. I learned Python only three years ago. <laughs> okay, so underlying is Java, and then we have the in-memory data cube, okay? With a BI analytic platform. So the history of the whole product is that this was sold alone, and this was sold as another product. And then now, because we have a Python wrapper, right, and we decided to have an op open software, so the entire thing is free, <laughs> right? Okay, so feel free to use it. Of course, there's the Euler. Check out the Euler first. <laughs> okay, everyone still with me? Can I continue a little bit more? Five more minutes, I think. Okay, so now to tell you a little bit more about the data cube or lab. Right, so typically OLAP, let me just do this. Okay, so we have some dimensions and we have some measures. So as I mentioned, just now we load, we create only one Atoti table. So therefore, I only have one dimension, which I named table by the way. So it's a silly name, but sorry. So this is actually the, the, the parent table and this is the table that I created. 
okay? And I have the, for each non-numerical columns or key column that we have selected, right, it will be created as a hierarchy. And beneath each of this hierarchy, right, is a single level. So by default, very curious, like what exactly is a cube? Ah? So cube can usually we data frame is 2D, right? Yes. Like 3D, right? It can <laughs> be more than 3D. So it's more dimensional. It's called multi-dimensional. Multi-dimensional thing. Exactly. So each of this is a dimension, as ah, you can. Exactly. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a hierarchy rather. So then oh. each table that you create is another dimension. So dimension actually groups the hierarchy, oh. and then hierarchy is the the so-called query that you will query your business metrics around, uh, right? So let's say, for example, which building, uh, what time, you know, and then maybe who. So these are the, the dimensions, right? The different dimensions that you can look at. And then uh, let's say, for example, quantity, all these are measures. So all the numerical figures that you are interested in in statistics, right, are measures. So for ATOT, right, by default, it will create them as mean and sum, and then we can actually have dot value. Okay, so this dot value is the single value that I've created earlier on. Okay, so basically this is the structure of a cube. So now with this structure, right, let me just quickly show you. So this, this is a customized feature for, for ATOT, where we have the ATOT editor here that will allow you to you know, interactively build the same thing as what we have done earlier on. So I can have my underlying code. Uh, and then here, I could actually drag and drop into the table. And then I ha can have a collapsible pivot table here, right? And then I will say, okay, so I can look at maybe, say, the quantity dot sum for each of this, right? And then I have the, maybe I want to look at the, PNL vector dot value as well. So here you can see that my PNL vector, I have 372 values in my list. Okay. So let's work a little bit more with the vector. Okay. So with the cube rather. So in order to work with the cube, so I can call cube dot hierarchies. Okay. Cube dot levels or cube dot measures to start working with them. So these are the three attributes of a cube. So then, say for instance, in this case, right, I have my PNL vector, okay, and I'm going to scale it up with the quantity dot sum. So it's as simple as taking the measure multiplied by this. So again, going back to what Mabel was saying, <laughs> so if I do a tab here, you'll be able to see the auto suggestions on what are the available values that you can use. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to use the value uh, PNL vector dot value sorry and then just to move on again let me just collapse this so that we can see it properly okay so now now that i have my scale pnl vector i'm going to perform an aggregation okay so there's two dimension here so on the scope level the instrument code and book id right and anything that you query below these two level right i will take the value of my scale pnl but for anything above it I will perform an aggregation that is a summation. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so let's do another vis uh, visualization. So now, this is my original vector, and then this is my scale one. So let's look at a simple number, like for example, this one. It was negative, and when I multiply by the negative one quantity, it becomes positive, right? So at the ins instrument code level, which I stated it, under the scope, right, you can see the value is exactly the same. But now what I have is I have a summation on top. Okay, so this is where the aggregation function kicks in, right? So I have a value on top. But we don't really want to work with vectors, right? I mean, it's not really readable, you know, we can't really use it. So what we are going to do now is we are going to create value at risk. Okay, that's the main purpose here. So for this value at risk, I'm going to create, use the, the array function, quantile, to take the 0 0.95%, the 95 percentile of my position vector. Okay, so now I can actually do a visualization. So let me just drag this a little bit. Okay, so then again, I have my instrument code, and then on my PNL, I have my vector. 
and then I have my var here. So you can see immediately it appears, right? So if I were to go back to my, my dashboard here, you'll be able to find the var as well, right? So whatever you do on the Jupyter Notebook site, right, it will be available on the dashboard site as well, okay? So your end users will be able to see it immediately. Okay, so now I actually have my value at risk. And then I could actually, let's say for example, I put my book ID because I want to view each one by book ID. You can see that here, when I sum up all the instruments under my book, right, the total value should be 101 and 927.09, uh, 309, sorry. But however, the top value here shows 47,080.63. Why is that so? Okay, why? Because we are summing up the vector and then we are taking the 95 percentile of this vector. Okay, so this is something we call non-linear aggregation. So you can actually decide, right, what formula to apply at what level and when you query it, it actually changes based on your query. Okay, and everything is actually computed on the fly as you compute, as you as you query them. So this is something different from OLAP because OLAP actually you have to perform the pre-aggregation first and then put everything into the, the LDAP, right? Into the OLAP, right? Sorry. And then when you query it, you have it. But here we define the formula and then as you query it, then we compute it on the fly. Okay? And not to mention that we actually support incremental data loading, which means that when you have new data coming in, I could call the load function, load it into the table, and immediately you will be able to see it in the data cube without having to restart it. So in the typical OLAP situation, right, you will have to restart your data cube. Okay? So finally, last portion here, which may be interesting for you. So you can see that here we have the formula. Let me just collapse this a little bit. We have the formula that we are taking the quantile array, uh, the, the quantile of the array by 0 0.95. So I'm going to create a parameter simulation on this 0 0.95. So in this case, right, I create the, this simulation where I create a measure called confidence level, which I defaulted to 0 0.95. I call the base this base scenario as 95 percent. Okay, so then if I were to query it, okay, so now it shows that I have this measure which is value 0 0.95. I could actually output this to a data frame and then I could actually query it along some other levels as well. Let's say, for example, I have, um, hmm, let me see, book ID, okay, and then I can also have my let's say instrument code right so if i output this df head so actually you can do your measure computation aggregations you know into a pivot table you query out and you can output it downstream you can do further computation you can merge it with other data you know create another cube again so the imagination is yours what you want to do with the data okay and now to go back to our initial formula okay so now Earlier on, I used 0 0.95 in this definition. So now I'm going to overwrite it with my new parameter simulation. Okay, so with confidence level that is defaulted to 0 0.95. And then let's do a, um, okay, let's do the visualization again. So you can see that now I still have my var, and then I'm going to create two more si simulation call 90% and 98%. So with the value 0 0.9 and 0 0.98 for instance, okay? So finally, I will be able to visualize them side by side in this manner. So I can actually have my computation with the 90 percentile, 98 percentile compared against my 95. So if you look at the editor here, what I simply added in is the simulation hierarchy here, confidence simulation. Okay? So Basically, the small program that I created is just to facilitate users to quickly do a analysis around a single CSV data source. But the library itself is not limited to that. You can actually expand on it depending on what you want to do. Uh, so that you can do things like this, example. So now, right, actually the key point is that with the vast amount of libraries out there, actually you don't have to code everything yourself. It's just a matter of imagining what you want, the end goal that you want to achieve, finding the right, correct libraries, put them together, you get a new product. Okay, so with that, I end my session.
Any questions? Yeah. Well, so the limit is your machine size. So, yeah, so the hard, hard disk space that you have, the RAM that you have in your machine, that limits how much data you can load into the, the cube, etc. So by default, I think we set a limit to use about 25% of your hardware RAM, but you could actually adjust this using the Java options. Okay, so in fact, if you put it on the cloud, then you could actually scale it according to your needs as well. Yeah, then, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Well, so it really, I'm not really a Power BI user, but I know the sharing is a little bit more difficult because you actually, I think if I'm not wrong, you have to host, you have to engage another product of Power BI to be able to start sharing, right? You have to host it or something? Uh, uh, then, uh, if you want to share, it's $10 per user. And, uh, but here... Yeah, exactly. But here, you know, like in this, I, I show you how I share it just now, right? So long as you host it somewhere, you know, that other people can use, even on your intranet, if someone else can access your machine, they can use the IP address to access your dashboard. But permissions, how come? Well, so that's where the paid version comes in. <laughs> so basically, it's without security, right? So if you want to implement security, like lock-in access, and then who can actually access the various data set, then you have to go for R30+, Plus, which is the paid version. Then you will be able to you know, connect it to your LDAP, or you know, you, if you have OIDC, you, know, you can actually have an authentication mechanism implemented in it. So then your users can actually lock in, and then based on the roles or user group, right? You can you can choose, uh, you can actually configure whether they can access certain file files, certain folders, certain dashboards, or even up to, up to the data layer. You can actually say that Team A can only access Country A, Team B access Country B. You know that kind of possibility is there once you have the authentication mechanism. But I think. By itself, the free version, you can do a lot of things. Everything that I've shown you inside is available in the free version, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, you can actually find this use case, right, in the GitHub gallery. So, under the, you can go to atoti, uh, github.com, atoti, slash atoti, slash notebooks. Then all the use cases are here. And then, in fact, right, if you expand it into the notebooks folder, then you can see we actually have a lot of use cases. The airline industry is contributed by a user. And then the rest, you know, like we created it on and off. So the AutoCube is the one that I have just demonstrated to you, the main advance and the main. So it's step-by-step -step guide. So actually, you will be able to follow through it yourself. And then, in fact, right, if you are more interested about did, you know, you can even go to medium.atoti whereby usually each use case, right, we try to create an, a, a corresponding article to explain how it works. So then, you know, you should be able to learn and pick up the tool by yourself. Yeah. So you can see the different ways to secure your Atoti session, for instance. You said you wrote a wrapper, Python wrapper around your Java libraries. How yes. of those libraries did you use with reflection and how did you like make the bindings between Python and Java? I won't be able to tell you I'm not from R and D. I would love to tell you, but then sadly they think that I'm too talkative, so I'm in the evangelist job and not R and D. <laughs> <laughs> it's open source. It's not open source. Oh, no, no, no. So it's like what um uh, premium one. Yes, exactly. So, but the free version at the moment, at least I think in my perspective, you can do all kinds of aggregations already. So the catch here is of course in the Euler is that normally we say that you could only have one builder and one reader, meaning that you can't really share your dashboard with a lot of people. You know, we set some limitation here. So initially when we first started out, we target the data science uh, domain because a lot of time we find that data scientists will find this very useful in prototyping, exploring their data, you know, build up the model, et cetera, and then to run simulation as well. So every time you have a machine learning algorithm that outputs some values, the question is, how would business find value in the prediction? So then you put your prediction into Atoti, 
where you already configured the business KPI, you create it as a scenario, you show the users, the business users, what is the original value, what is the predicted value, and then when you have the actual value coming in, you could show what is the actual value itself. Right? So all once you have set up the model itself, you just need to fit your machine learning prediction into the system. So the, likewise for financial industry, you know, you have your own risk engine, you know, multicolor simulations, etc. You could actually load it inside, run through the business KPI and see how they differ from you know one another. That kind of idea. Yeah. Um, the, the dashboard itself, if you have right in the dashboard, you can make it like as a report, right? Now my question was like if for example the data has changed, um is there like an, a refresh or do I need to run more through the so, to, 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 to just change I mean, because they already have set up the dashboard. It's just that the data. I mean yeah. I'm I'm looking at the perspective of reporting for yeah. example. So basically, the idea is that uh, because RTOT support incremental data loading, right, which means that you can actually add data on the go without having to restart. And then your users will be able to access the data immediately when they query it. So if I were to go back to the dashboard itself here, okay, let me go into presentation mode. Notice here there's a small icon here. You can actually turn on real-time mode. So meaning that as data come in, right, your query will refresh and then you'll see the latest value on the widgets. So you can con control them widget by widget to show the data real time. But depending on your business use case, because not everybody require real time because it's resource more intensive, right? So any time that you, you want to get the latest data, right? you could actually just right click and refresh the query. You get the latest data. So then it's a matter of how you organize your data. So for example, in bank, you know, you have your S of date, day one, day two, day three, day four. And then you just have to set the slicing so that every day you just see a single day and then you can order them so that you only see the latest date for instance and then when you want to see the previous data you can always switch your you know you can play around with the quick filter for instance or the or, or here even you know in the filter editor you have like page filter dashboard filter this widget filter that you can actually apply so that you can look at different data or date range for instance yeah. I would suggest uh, some of you have more questions, just come forward and, and ask We found it uh, directly. Maybe the rest of us who doesn't have questions should finish up the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Mike also needs some time to pack up his stuff, and it's quite late already. So yeah, once again, We found, thank you for your talk. Very thank nice. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. And like I said, if you have more questions, just walk around, ask people, and help me finish the pizza. <laughs>